So hi, I'm Coach Carla. I'm a fitness coach and entrepreneur with Healthitude. I am also a co-owner of Equilibrium Fitness in beautiful downtown West Seattle. And Dave Farrow is my guest here. He's a memory expert. And because I'm not a memory expert, I'm going to read a little information about Dave Farrow. <laughs> He's the two-time Guinness World Record holder for the greatest memory. He has been featured guest expert in over 2,000 interviews in the media, including the Today Show, Live with Regis and Ka Kelly, <laughs> DRP, <laughs> every channel, and many others. To earn the world record, Mr. Farrow recalled the exact order of 59 decks of shuffled playing cards using the Farrow memory method. This method was originally invented to combat Dave's uh, dyslexia and ADHD and is now a unique memory system backed by double-blind neuroscience study at McGill University. Yay! So, Dave, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you very much for having me. This is a lot of fun. Now, you've been uh, looking at the uh, memory tournament manual for a while and uh, trying some of these techniques, so uh, tell us your thoughts. Yes, I actually was, uh, I read it cover to cover, first of all. I do have this and I haven't gone through it just yet. My homework isn't done yet, but I was able to memorize all 20 items on the random uh, item list. I was able to figure out that uh, uh, zero through nine, how to figure out the numbers. That was really super cool, the little story, the anecdotal story about the, the thousand, doing pi to the yep. thousand number. We're going we're to tell people about that story, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell you something. One of my biggest embarrassments is the fact that I can't remember even my best friend's name to introduce them because I get so stressed out about introducing them to a group. I'm trying to remember the group of people and then I just forget my best friend's name. It's humiliating. <laughs> so I'm an actress. I want to be able to remember my script like that. Mm -hmm. I, I want to remember people's names and not be embarrassed anymore. I want to remember where my keys are or my cell phone are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I followed some of your methods to uh, be able to ignite that superhuman memory. But I'm mm -hmm. by far no expert whatsoever. So I'm going to shut up and let you talk. Oh, you're an expert in a lot of things. But uh, yeah, no, memory is, is my big passion in life. Um, I do... Uh, I do um, uh, I, I, I do this training because I know what it's like to uh, struggle with your memory, you know? Um, can you hear me okay? Is it... Uh... Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, I get it. Okay. All right. I'm just doing a little feedback over here. So um, I know what it's like to really struggle with your memory. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia when I was a kid. And here is the big bombshell that I would like to tell people that just uh, changes absolutely everything. Um, memory is a skill and you don't need repetition in order to memorize. That's one of the biggest mistakes. So uh, you, for example, you're an actress, you want to uh, memorize your lines. Um, you don't need to repeat them over and over and over and over and over to memorize them. There's actually another way. And you know, because you went through the book, that it's more of a creative way. You come up with kind of silly pictures in your head. And I, I can actually share with you how to adapt that to memorizing, uh, uh, memorizing your, your lines as well, because I've worked with a lot of actors on that. But essentially what it is, is uh, your brain really likes to have stories, it really likes to have imagery, it really likes to have um, other things going on. Another thing your brain really, really enjoys is when there's something uh, wild or crazy that happens. Um, I usually refer to it as the tiger in the jungle. Um, if you think that our brains, uh, if you think back to hunter-gatherer times, you know, um, um, times with uh, cavemen and women, uh, and our brains are fundamentally haven't changed much since those very primitive times. So a lot of the problems that we have, like, like stress, anxiety, uh, a lot of the, the social issues we have, even, even you know, drug addiction and things like that, from a neurological perspective, have actually been traced back to the fact that we are uh, primitive ancestors living in a modern world, right? So my brain is really good. All of our brains are really good at hunting and gathering, and yet we're doing taxes and other, you know, other stuff, uh, which sucks. Um, so 
here is what your brain really likes to do. And, and, and essentially, I usually think of my program as a way to adapt the, the, the modern world to what your brain really, really enjoys. So uh, if I'm uh, talking to a bunch of students, for example, uh, in colleges and they're studying for their exam, you know, your brain is really not good at focusing on the same thing for eight hours or six hours studying. Uh, we know from charts uh, and lots of studies on this that most people, when they're studying information, they're memorizing information, they're going to remember maybe the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes and the stuff in the middle, they have about a 10% chance of memorizing it. Yeah, it's, it's called the primary and tertiary or, or primary and recency uh, principle. The first thing and the last thing that you hear is what you tend to remember. Have you ever had that experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I want to interact with you a bit more than just do a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, and, and also have noted that uh, uh, first thing, a little more challenging, but the last thing is always something that I'm, I'm remembering. And even when, when I message something to somebody, they generally answer the very last question. They yeah. Don't, yeah, the middle question. Yeah, yeah, you get that too. We, we tend to pay attention. Well, here's why this happens. This might blow your mind. I call it the tiger in the jungle. This is kind of my analogy, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, so you're a hunter-gatherer. You're walking through the jungle, right? And you see a tree and a rock and a little bush and another tree, lovely stream, a tiger right there, another tree, another rock you know, another like path going off in the corner. And now which one of those things are you going to pay attention to most? Uh, the scary things. <laughs> the, the tiger, of course, like, like the tiger is the thing that's going to stick it. You won't even get to the other stuff. You won't even get to the tree. You won't even get to the, any, you're, you're going to pay attention to the tiger that's in the jungle. And in fact, if we did not do that immediately, we would not probably, probably not be here because human, human beings would have been eaten by the, all the tigers. We would not have survived. So we have this amazing ability to memorize something the first time. We just don't think of that as memory. But you can memorize, so you'll memorize the, like the, think, of, think of a, if you've ever had a stressful experience, maybe a car accident or something, some sort of crisis, uh, and, and you remember the where, the what, the who, provided you didn't get a head injury, you remember all sorts of details, what the color of the car was, all sorts of things. And, and a lot of these things really stick in your mind. It's the same sort of tiger in the jungle mentality. When, when something's riding on the line, your brain really wakes up. Well, we can actually do that with, uh, with creativity. So instead of me creating a scary situation in my mind, I can create a really funny one or a really wild visually one. But what happens is all the other things in that scene are boring compared to the tiger. You know, your brain does not want to see more rocks, does not want to see more trees. It wants to see something interesting. So, you know, I could say the same analogy if I'm walking through the jungle and I see all these different things and Mickey Mouse is in the corner and everything else is boring, your brain pays attention to Mickey Mouse. I just, I can't, you know, use that because Walt Disney, you know, sues people. <laughs> But uh, so, so that's essentially the principle and it's, and it's how you apply the principle. So, um, but I wanted to go, go back and forth with you a little bit and ask you times when you've tried to memorize things and just let you know what's going on in your brain. So there's the act of trying to memorize stuff. There's the, the effort that you have to put forward. And then there is the inactive um, sort of embarrassment type stuff. You know, the times where you feel like you should memorize something and you're blanking out. So, um, Right now, what you're doing with the training is you're practicing the active stuff. I want to memorize this list. I will memorize it. And essentially, we can create little stories out of it and memorize it quite easily. But you might not realize that actually helps you with the other stuff, the embarrassed, uh, blanking out moments. So tell me, tell me a moment, a typical moment that people experience uh, blanking out, and I'll tell you what's going on in the brain and probably how to prevent it. I would have to say that the number one experience would be putting somebody in front of a group of people. Yeah. And they blank out. They forget what they're going to say yeah. or uh, they forget someone's name. So I'm going to get you guys to do one little exercise. I see a couple people here. So you're going to do an exercise with me. I want you to, I'm going to tell you a few places that you should know. And I want you to visualize it in your mind's eye and uh, you know, answer some questions. So first of all, first of all um, your car uh, if you could visualize your car, uh, what uh, color is it on the inside? 
tan. Black. Black. Okay. Now, I, I actually, I actually noticed it with you, Tom, really quickly there, where your eyes went like boop boop. Did you <laughs> notice that? You know, I'm, I'm going to do this again. Um, I want to think of, uh, and you can you can look for it as well. I want you to think of your bedroom, and I want you to tell me um, what uh, the uh, how big your dresser is. Uh, if you could measure it, how wide would you say your dresser is? Three feet. Uh, six feet. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's a wide yeah, dresser. Right. No, but uh, but Tom, did you see it in Carla though? Your eyes kind of went over there, and you go, oh, okay. See, the interesting thing is when we're trying to remember information, we actually look slightly up and to the left and to the right. Uh, in fact, most of the time, a lot of times, it can be incredibly far up. You can look like this. You're like, oh, what is the answer to that? Where am I going? So you've been in that situation. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's what's actually going on. Behind your eyeball is a large bundle of nerves called the optic nerve. And it's about the size of a golf ball, uh, two of them, you know, behind your eyeballs. And uh, they're not considered part of the brain, but they, um, they should be actually. A lot of neuroscientists would consider them part of brain research. Uh, and essentially what we know for a fact, we don't know exactly how all of this works. There's actually a very famous quote from a neuroscientist that said that if we were to distill you know, if everything that there is to know about the brain was a city, all of neuroscience could be summed up by being essentially um, a half-drunk person sitting under a street lamp that can barely see around him. That's about as much as we know for sure about the brain. Uh, on one city block, if the whole brain is the city, you're like one little patch of granite. Okay, we know that that's cement. We know that that's a curb and we know that that's a light. There's some basic, very basic things. One of the interesting things that we definitely know about the brain is that by directing your eyeballs in different directions, it actually directs the energy in your brain. We don't know why exactly. The theory is that um, you know, hunters didn't want to be distracted. So like if they're trying to remember something, they would look up so they're not looking around at things. If they're, and, and the typical thing that a hunter would remember would be like, you know, where, wh how to get to the watering hole or some, you know, some travel from place to place, that sort of thing. But really most people, do, you know, most you know, scientists don't know for sure why this happens. But when we're trying to remember things, we look up. When we're trying to talk to ourselves and calm ourselves down, we look down. And what happens is when you're stressed out and you're in front of an audience, like you said, Carla, and you're trying to remember something, uh, you're looking down, you know, you, you start to go, oh, um, um, what am I going to, what jokes, right? Yeah, I'm going to think of something here, right? Oh, what, it, oh, what is that, right? That's and you're staring true. down. You do that? <laughs> yes, that's true. Wow, I never thought about that. And you know what's really funny? As you were saying that, I looked up to see in my memory when I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it worked. It, it turned out to be true. Yeah. So what we can do to help people with this is if you're ever feeling forgetful, you can remember to do this and try looking up. In fact, I've had people uh, write down on little post-it notes on their computer, on their um, on their uh, uh, bathroom mirrors, you know, to say, keep looking up. And it wasn't even a positive thinking type thing. It was, it was a, you know, if you're ever feeling forgetful, if you're ever feeling stressed, take a breath, look up, and you have greater access to your cerebral cortex and the rest of your brain. Wow. <laughs> you blew my mind, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's little things like that that make us think about the brain differently. When we realize that something as little as moving where your eyes focus changes everything. I, um, I talk to uh, students about this all the time. And students uh, who are in the middle of exams, they're, you know, they, they've, got, they've got this exam paper, for example, right? And they're, they're staring down at it and they stare and they stare at the question and they're like, oh, what is that? What is it? I don't know. Oh my God. They're shielding themselves. They couldn't possibly look up, right? They're shielding themselves. And then they blank out, they hand the sheet in and they walk down the hall for a few steps and immediately it pops into their head and they remember exactly what they were supposed to remember. Uh, that's happened to me many times. <laughs> <laughs> So here's what I want you to do. And here, I'll do a little exercise with you guys uh, along with the looking up part. So you want to take a moment and look up. That'll always you know, help you improve your recall. The other major thing I want you to do is to do uh, belly breathing. Uh, now, Carla, you know belly breathing, right? I absolutely know. I, we end all of our uh, uh, classes with belly breathing. Yes. So what would, you, what would you sum up is 
why belly breathing is more, was so important. I want to hear it from another teacher who teaches it because I might have some, I might even be able to teach you something about belly breathing you didn't know and you could teach me. Oh, you definitely can. <laughs> um, just spread it. It actually gives your diaphragm a chance to act, to completely expand. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest problems is that we don't exhale. It's not just the inhale, it's the exhale. So if you place your hands on your ribs and you push out, until you fill your abs, you're actually exhaling all the uh, carbon dioxide out of your body. So you ha can, act can take a deeper breath the next time and replenish your oxygen. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, um, the neuroscience side of the, um, uh, of, of the, the, uh, the story is that we have two different uh, nerve systems. Uh, they're referred to as your autonomic and your automatic nerve system. So most people talk about it as your conscious and unconscious nerve system, right? We usually think of that in terms of the conscious and subconscious brain. People think in terms of sleeping and things like that. And that's very true. Uh, there's actually a mechanism in the brain that stops, that paralyzes your body, a body paralysis while you sleep to make sure that when you're, you know, running in your dream, you're not running in reality, right? Suppose. <laughs> supposed to yeah I supposed to. Bed, that's, some that's people true. don't some people wander off uh <laughs> oh is that tom are you, are you did you uh did you wander off sometimes always <laughs> <laughs> all right so um here's here's what's actually going on uh and and something that might surprise you is that your your lungs and your diaphragm are the only uh for lack of a better word the the the, the only organ that we seem to have uh, that that is in both camps. Now you could argue that your eyes are too, because your eyes, your pupils dilate, and maybe during REM sleep you you look back and forth. You salivate subconsciously, so all of your organs do this a little bit. But the interesting thing about your 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 lungs is that I have the complete ability to breathe in when I want to, breathe out when I want to, exactly however I want to. I can control it 100%. But if I don't think about it, if I'm doing other things my brain will breathe for me. I am not going to, I'm not going to pass out and die, right? <laughs> Thank at least I, at least I hope not. So, so it's, it's, it's a true subconscious and conscious autonomic and automatic nervous system. Here's why that's important because when you're stressed out, when you're panicking, your, your autonomic nervous system, your subconscious nervous system to deal with the panic is going to make you hyperventilate. This is a, a way to prepare you for a fight or to run for your life, okay? This is not uh, the way to live in modern society. So um, the, one of the best examples is if you've ever surprised somebody, what's the, the look on their face? They're like, <gasps> right? That's, that's a surprise look. Why on earth would, would our evolution and everything make our bodies do this goofy move, right? <laughs> Well, look at it closely. I'm moving my elbows away from my body so I can take in a lot of oxygen right? Opening my mouth. That's why people go, <gasps> right? Why do they do that? They're taking in as much oxygen as they can because the very next thing is to run for your life in the hunter gatherer world, in that primitive world. So I'm going, <gasps> you know, it's because I'm, I'm opening up my lungs, making myself look big to intimidate and taking in as much oxygen because I'm about to fight or flight. So how this is really important is people do this in the middle of an exam. And this is, this is meant to be how you, how you meet a gorilla. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is meant for fight or flight. This is not meant to be an intellectual pursuit. This is not meant to be, I, I open up a check and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be fined by the government. I'm going, <gasps> you know, I, I, I can't fight the government. I can't run away from the government. So my body is reacting in a very primitive way to very modern things going on. Um, and that's what happens when you uh, start to panic when you're forgetful. When you're forgetful, you'll, you'll breathe more shallowly. You might not even notice it. It might be much more subtle. It might be like... <sighs> You ever see people like this? They're, they're, they're yeah. breathing through their teeth and like, yeah. oh my God. And they're trying to memorize something. Oh, I've got this. It's in my head. Right? They're breathing really shallowly. What's happening is you're building up a lot of cortisol. Cortisol um, is an anti-inflammatory. It's, uh, you know, it does a bunch of good things, uh, but it also does a bunch of bad things. It makes you very stressed. It's your stress hormone. Um, so, just to recap, you know, we got our student in the exam. You've got you, you know, um, um, 
blanking out in, on stage, the same sort of metabolic process is happening. Your body thinks you're about to be chased by a tiger when in actuality, all the things that your body is trying to do to you is making it tougher for you to do what your, what your job is. So my job is to remember the answer to this question and my, my body is, is breathing really shallowly. I'm releasing a lot of cortisol, which is interfering with my brain's ability to think. Um, and uh, blood flow is going to my muscles, not going to my brain because it's that fight or flight response. So the best way to reverse this is to take control of those lungs and literally do the belly breathing, do three or four belly breaths, look up because it forces you not to look down and, and be a worry wart. You look up, do a few belly breaths, and you'll, you'll, you'll get rid of that stress response very quickly. In fact, I do this, and I've got, I've got, a, you know, I've got a stressful job. I, I, run, I run several businesses. I've got employees. I, I, got, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff. I get stressed out all the time, but you stop, look up, breathe three times. It, it gets rid of the cortisol. It is, it is a biological reaction. It is not psychological. It is not... I'm not telling people feel bad about yourself because you're not able to calm yourself down. It's a biological reaction. You've got a really good stress response now trigger that relaxation response. Okay. That's, that, that's fascinating. <laughs> I could, I'm picturing myself using it before I go on stage, by the way. Um, so you also let me know that you could help my entrepreneurs out there help their clients remember them. Oh, yes, yes. How to get people to remember, remember you better. Okay. Yeah. So, um, as you know, with the, uh, the list technique that you were memorizing there, uh, you know, we, we give the challenge in the book, and, and this is also in our, in our uh, event on the 16th, we give the challenge to uh, you know, memorize a list of items like 20, 30 things in a row. And then you ask people, you know, how would you memorize it? Most people would repeat it over and over and over. But what we do is I take you through word after word, and I just basically make a story out of it. If you remember the story, you remember every single one of these words, and magic presto, uh, uh, you're able to, to score three to four times greater on memory tests. Now, this is not just some sort of trick in a, you know, in a group, in a setting, in a hotel. Uh, we did this in a double-blind neuroscience study in McGill University. We did this with, uh, we got 20 grad students to go through the training. They tried to memorize a list of objects just with rote repetition, didn't work. Then uh, they made a little story out of it using certain techniques and, and strategies that we teach. And they were able to remember every single one of them just about every single time. They scored three times the average on memory. So the question is, then comes, well, if I have a product, how can I get people to remember me better? How can I get them to remember that better? And here it essentially is kind of some of the golden rules, okay? Um, the, the products that win the memory contest are the ones that are most sensory and the ones that, that, that tie into their name most often, okay? So uh, I'll give you a very simple example here, uh, the Geico Gecko. You know, you ever heard of the Geico Gecko or the Aflac Duck? Yes. <laughs> yeah? So um, they are perfect right, mnemonics. Like <laughs> What's that? Great. Now all I hear is Aflac. Aflac. <laughs> For 20 Aflac. minutes. <laughs> Aflac. Yeah. Um, well, let's take the Geico Gecko. Geico uh, was an acronym. It stood for Government Employee Insurance Corporation. It was, it was this terrible thing. They couldn't, they, they didn't know what it was all about. So uh, the, somebody said, hey, it sounds like a gecko. Let's try that. And it was almost because they didn't have any previous experience. It wasn't State Farm or anything else. They could do whatever they want. So they went kind of cheesy. And boy, did it work. The Geico Gecko is remembered. And it's remembered because it ties into the name. It's a play on the name. And uh, it, it, it's, it's memorable because it's an object. If it was a, if it was a you know, the mouse pad or the, the deck of cards or the, the pen, it wouldn't be nearly as memorable. But when you have a mascot, that's why a lot of sports teams have mascots, then it's a kind of a character, an exaggerated version. This goes back to the tiger in the jungle. You have to have an exaggerated version of whatever it is you're teaching. And by the way, if you're trying to go after a corporate audience, then you might not want to do this uh, in the same way because corporate audiences are very, very uh, stale. They're very, you know, they're very conservative, but you can still use the same sort of effect. Um, and that is kind of that aha moment. So the Aflac Duck's another great example. People remember that because uh, it, it, it sticks in the mind and then it reminds you of the company name. Uh, we did this for uh, Farrell for a little while, actually. Um, this, uh, this was the, uh, the logo for, uh, for my company 
uh, Pharaoh PR for, for ages. And you can see it's a little Egyptian Pharaoh, right? And we did it all kind of stylish and everything, right? And um, that actually, uh, we've changed it recently uh, to, um, to something else that looks kind of cool. All right, so this one was a play on my name, my last name, Pharaoh, and people want to remember. The problem is that I, I'm not Egyptian, so uh, it could be a little bit of a cultural thing. Um, in, in today's day and age, we have to be more sensitive to that. But also, it seemed a little cheesy. We wanted to go a little bit more corporate. So um, I went with a, with a different uh, uh, logo here. Okay, so, so this is what we're working on with some of our, uh, some of our logos here. So uh, you see the, uh, the Brain Hackers logo right here. Right. Well, we have um, a logo with uh, Pharaoh, which is just a, an F with an arrow. You see how it's kind of cut out, and then there's an arrow made out of the F and, and everything. I'll take you off of off of mute. So yeah, you can... I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Now this this also the, this is also within uh, within the uh, the brain symbol. So this would be the Pharaoh memory symbol, and we're kind of working on those things. But right now, um, our logo uh, on its own, just that just that F with the arrow. It goes, you know, Pharaoh after that is, is what we're using for our, our new logo. And it gives that same aha moment, but that's the modern styling. You know, we want to want to appeal to the corporate audience, so it's a modern styling. But F and arrow, because that's the way it's spelt, Pharaoh, F and arrow. So um, anyways, I kind of did that over and over. Um, you know, you can also see this with Walmart and their, uh, their love of the, uh, the smiley face, the happy face. You can see it with uh, McDonald's and the, and, and the clown. A lot of people are keep creeped out by the clown now, but back in the day, you know, when I was growing up, that was, uh, you know, 60s and 70s as well. That's what made McDonald's huge because it appealed to kids and clowns were not creepy back then. They were fun. Um, I have to remind people of that. It was Stephen King who ruined it. We can blame him. <laughs> and it was it was well i mean maybe i mean i want to say it was batman and joker a little bit but let's be honest i mean even batman was campy until stephen king came out with that and they were like oh now we can make the joker dark um anyways, anyways yeah, i'm okay. a big batman fan <laughs> um but uh, there's some other you know neat ones uh you know this is a, a great example of, of of branding the hershey's kiss too um, making yourself so. It, so here are the general rules that you want to follow. Here, um, a general rule uh, is uh, you want it to be an object. You want it to be something that people can tangibly see, and and something that's more physical. But you want it to have a moment where they get it. So with the uh, F and the arrow, they get it. They're like, oh, Pharaoh and F and arrow, and it's the negative space. Oh, when they see it, it sticks in the mind, and they never forget that. Right. Um, with, uh, with the, the Pharaoh hat, you know, they, they saw it once I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this head here. So you remember my name, Pharaoh immediately it's stuck in the mind. Um, and, uh, you know, every sports team that has a mascot, you know, that does that, uh, everyone that, that works really well sticks in their mind. Now you might've noticed Geico tried a bunch of different things from a pig to a bunch of things, but it was the, uh, the, the gecko that stuck. So it was a play on that words. So, um, Here's what I really suggest is when you're, when you're dealing with people in your names, you can actually come up with little tricks to get them to remember your names. And they don't have to be cheesy. They can actually be a lot of fun. I have one customer of mine who's named Sylvia. She's a Southern lady. So she said in a wonderful accent, every time she shakes someone's hand, she says, just think of silver because I'm so precious. <laughs> I like it. And I'm like, there you go. Um, I had another one. Uh, whose last name was Quelo, Joe Quelo. And uh, you might think Quelo is difficult to remember, but it actually means rabbit in Portuguese. Well, most of his clients are not Portuguese, so they don't know that. But he put a little rabbit on his business card, and it's a conversation starter. They say, hey, why is that rabbit there? And you go, oh, well, Quelo means rabbit in Portuguese. You want to know how many times people call him looking for the rabbit guy, for the, uh, the bunny rabbit guy, you know, that sort of thing. But the point is the phone gets to them. You know, and, they, and he actually picks up and that's how he gets the sales. So getting people to remember your name uh, works really well. We have um, another person named Tina McQuaid, uh, Toronto. She's a real estate agent. She does, she's more of a green agent. So she uh, deals with like more environmental issues and, and, and you know, very, uh, very uh, green friendly homes. So we made a logo where her, her, the T of Tina was made really big and, and it, it was fanned out to be a tree. So it was like, uh, you know, uh, I guess we could call it Tree Namake or, or Tree McQuaid. Um, but uh, that's kind of a play on the words. And then the, the logo becomes that tree. And then people were, were mentioning, oh, hey, I, I, I remember you because I remember the tree. And you're, oh, you're wow. the environmental one, you know? 
That's awesome. So, so that's how you get you get your name to be stuck. And you, you turn it into a little story and you have that aloha moment. Now I'll tell you, some people might think this is silly. Some people might think this is weird. Um, I, uh, when I used the uh, Pharaoh symbol back in the day, uh, I've, I've, um, that was, uh, that was part of the reason I did uh, over $170,000 in sales from one radio show. Um, I did a quarter million dollars in sales on a religious program because we're using the Pharaoh symbol. People were able to remember the name of the product and they were able to Google me. Um, so yeah, it's silly. It's silly all the way to the bank. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but figure out, figure out it, it, what it is, you know, for you, right? You were actually talking to me about, about your, your name and your last name was hard to spell. So that's why you went with coach Carla as well. Yeah. Coach so, Carla, that, coach Carla yeah. helped. Yeah. It's yeah. all the way across to everything. Um, Motashimi is not an easy name to spell or say. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. But, but it's like, you, you know, you see that as well. Actors do the same thing where, you know, it's uh, someone changes their last name because it's a very long, complex name. Yeah. You know? So you, you kind of mentioned something happening on the December 16th. What is that? Yeah. So uh, December 16th is coming up really, really soon. Um, I actually am going to give a special offer to your, your viewers here. Um, I will actually pay your way to go to this event because we are in the last minute, the last stretch, and I need 10 more people to go to this event. Um, it is uh, the Sin City Memory Tournament. It is a competition in Las Vegas. It is awesome. Uh, everybody will learn all the memory techniques, and you also get to practice and improve your memory and enjoy the, the whole process. And in addition to that, it is part of a larger event called SkillCon, which actually goes out to ESPN and ESPN2. Um, it's hosted by a celebrity, and they have all sorts of sports from uh, speed, Rubik's Cube, cornhole, uh, frisbee stuff, juggling, um, um, all sorts of things, robotics. So you get to try out all these other, all, all the other events. They might have a slight fee to that for them. I'm not going to pay for all that, but I will pay for your, your, uh, your pass to go to uh, the event, a one-day pass to go to this event, and also um, um, uh, give your registration to my event, uh, absolutely no charge. Uh, if you sign up, just contact Carla uh, or get it to me. Uh, my email is dave at PR. So Dave, Dave at Faro PR, right there, um, dot com, and uh, and I'll uh, I'll get you onto the VIP list. It's a simple little VIP list for for a few people like you that that we're offering this to, and I want to you know get you out to this event. It is a as a one time only thing. I don't know how, if we're going to do this again, but I, I got to get some attendance boosted in here. So if you know anybody in the Vegas area you want to pass this on to, feel free. All right, great. Thank you so much. And this is an amazing offer, you guys. So everybody in the Vegas area or even LA, you can drive on over there. It's not very far. I want you to take advantage of this. I'm, I'm really excited about going to some of Dave's events in the future. And I want to thank you so much, Dave. I want, I'm about to wrap up the call because it's going to shut me off in a second. <laughs> but I want to thank you for coming on the call. I'm going to post this uh, video on my YouTube page and on Coach Carla Helps on my Facebook page. So be sure to go there. And I'm going to would you would you please uh, message me the information for SkillCon or for for this event and this offer, and I will post that too in the comments of the video. All awesome. Right? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate Tom coming on there live, the only one who was brave enough to go on video with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much to all the people uh, seeing this, also seeing this later as a recording. I appreciate it, and hope to see you in Vegas. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Yay. All right, Take bye, care. everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Carla. You're Thanks. welcome.